Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 245, dos, cuatro, cinco, dos, cuatro, cinco. How are you guys doing? Great. Amazing. How am I? As you can tell, I'm pretty hyped, man. Just had my breakfast, a nice balanced keto breakfast, a few scrambled eggs, some spinach, a couple of bits of bacon, some sausage. Feeling good. A large glass of coffee. I had actually two cups of coffee actually between the time I've started having breakfast and when I sat down here. I've had a glass of water that I've also got to the side there and I'm feeling ready to go, ready to pod, ready to talk, ready to communicate, ready to share. Hope you guys are ready too. Um, yeah, today I'm going to do a bit of running after work as my usual training plan. I think today no no gym or maybe, yeah, no, I have, don't have, actually have time because I'm doing this podcast now before I leave, but I'm going to do a bit of running to, uh, after work. Yesterday, I did manage to run. I, ma- I ran like three miles yesterday, but remember I told you I had a weird, my toe was a bit inflamed. I'm not sure what happened to it. It's a bit swollen. My, the, my, the, 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 my second toe, right? The one on the left side of my big toe was a bit inflamed. Not sure if I got it caught in something when I was sleeping or whether or not I bent it when I was running in my loafers. I don't know. Something happened to my toe. It's a bit mangled. So now I'm feeling good. My toe is fine. It's not mangled anymore. I was meant to run it. It really, it hurt a lot, actually. I think the fact that my my foot, my left foot was messed up, it made it so that when I was running outside, I was kind of running off balance. I was like, you know, the left foot was kind of like stumbling. I don't know how to, do you know how to describe it. Like it was a bit like, I was running a bit lopsided. So I ended up having a lot of pain and a lot of spasms in my right foot. I never get plantar fasciitis anymore because I do a lot of mobility exercises and generally I think I've improved my um, the muscle the muscular structure of my arch on my right foot or my left foot one of the others that was really causing me issues so I tend not to get um, plantar fasciitis anymore that kind of pain that you the sharp shooting pain you usually get on your forefoot when your feet aren't as strong or as um, conditioned as they should be. I'm, I'm sure that's the reason why most of it and sometimes it comes a lot to do with the fact that you don't have an arch or your foot's a bit flat. So now that I've kind of built an arch into my foot through, you know, loads of training and loads of kind of mobility exercise, all that stuff and loads of stuff from the Kelly Starrett, um, supple leopard way of thinking, I don't really get it anymore. But yesterday I got it and I'm I'm sure, I'm pretty sure it was because my other foot was swollen so that it was, whenever I was kind of trying to um, compensate for my other foot being swollen, my other foot was probably landing the wrong way and I ended up kind of, get, kind of it ended up freezing up on me a little bit. But today I think I should be fine. I'm going to do a bit of massaging on this ball here that I've got there. Let me see if I can show you. So I've got this little ball here. You can't see if you listen to the podcast app, but it's a little, it's a mass, it's a really hard lacrosse ball. It's super, super hard. Like, you know, you can't really squeeze it or anything. So I use this and just stand, basically um, hold against the wall and basically put my entire weight of the foot that kind of is inflamed all over this and kind of just smash it through and try and get all those muscle um, bits of tissue and ligaments, all that sort of stuff, smash, 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 smashed. And usually it does a good, it does really well to terms of kind of opening up and freeing up your foot. It hurts at the time, don't get me wrong. You're going to scream in pain, you're going to rive around. But much like the foam roller, it's a kind of necessary uh, thing, especially if you run as much as I do, or especially if you exercise a lot. If you're kind of like a, a frequent to a, you know, regular exerciser, I say maybe three to four times a, or three to five times a week, you should be doing some of this stuff because, you know, it does help in the long run. I think so. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, but yeah, feeling good, feeling fine. Five miles later on today. And then we'll go from there. So let's not waste any time. Let's get straight into the topics because, you know, we don't have any time or we don't have much time. So we want to make the most of it as we go. Um, but I was thinking, right, talking about running, I stumbled across this amazing video of this guy that the New York Times uh, profiled called uh, Mimo, right? Um, a supposed um, immigrant. Well, this is. Sorry. A supposed immigrant from Mexico. Um, illegal immigrant actually in the beginning but then he ended up getting his papers and he's um he's a very prolific runner in his age group i think he's i'm not sure how old he is i think he's at 50 something 50 something he must be 50 something i'm not sure how oh no he's 46 years old right he's one of the fastest he's one he's globally one of the fastest runners in his age group right in full, of, of his age group but he's very low key he works a porter job cleaning he, he's basically a, a maintenance man or like a caretaker for buildings in his local area <coughs> cleaning windows taking out the rubbish that kind of general stuff but in his spare time he just runs and runs really fucking well but he's very low key doesn't like any attention doesn't want anyone to know what he does he just does it for it's it's, it's, it's purely for his own enjoyment and it got me thinking about sharing runs on social media and just in general just being like a social media runner when i first started running uh, blah, 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 when i'm gonna say this this is probably for me when when was it it must have been 
early 2000s no no early 2000s like 2015 maybe 13 when i first did my cup first couple of races i loved it because of that kind of side of it right the fact that you could like share your races especially with the nike run plus right the nike run the nike run app the nike the nike plus app and then it went to nike run club app that app was really integral to kind of um helping me get from being a fat slob to actually running some races and it was very interactive it had its own little social media kind of community platform side of things but then over time as per usual you know nike always have a, a way of kind of pissing in their own um cups right so they end up messing around a bit too much and now over time it's turned into a bit of a shit app it doesn't really let you the social media side of it is a bit crap it's turning around like a run club thing you can't export the data it's just gonna be shit and i felt as if like a lot of people have kind of moved off of it right and also i feel i feel as if like maybe in the last few years people have stopped kind of sharing their runs in that way like in the distance i don't know i don't really see it as much as i did in the past i think it was really big in the past about showing the route you've done how many times you're training but now so much so i think people are a bit more low-key or they've, they've switched over to the, the other app which i use now at the moment called um strava which is a little bit more Mm, professional i'd say professional say professional or a little bit more uh pro of an app to use so um with the nike strava app you don't need to really share much stuff you don't need to be all like all over social media with your thing you just run and kind of keep keep on doing your thing right let me see if i can oh man why is it not doing let me do this but anyway um let me see if i can find this i'm trying to find my Flickr account so i can see my pictures of me running but i don't really have it do i um i guess let's see if i can find it actually the thing uh barcelona half marathon so i switched over to strava too and strava doesn't necessarily allow you to you can't um you can't exactly how do you say it you can't um you can't exactly share very easily your runs on strava it doesn't really work that way so because of that, I tended now to kind of like concentrate mostly on just running and just kind of doing my thing and keep it moving. Not really concentrating on, you know, putting my stuff up online and showing how many stuff I'm doing. So it's kind of made me question how I interact with um, social media when I'm running. And in general, I don't really, right? I tend to kind of concentrate on my running. I tend to have an audio book on, a long podcast, a new album I want to listen to, and that's about it. And I just kind of run, save the, save the um, run, and just keep it moving, save my activity, keep it moving. And plus, with I think with Strava, the only way to actually share the run it is to go back into the actual run you did once you finished it and then share it onto your social media platforms. It's a bit clunky. It's not the most easiest thing to use. So because of that, it makes it easy to just like, you know, forget about it and just keep it moving. But this video kind of expounded upon that and really made me think about it even more. So I'm going to play it for you now and then we can talk about it as we continue. Uh, here we go. It's an opinion piece. It's called, um, it's from the New York Times. It's called Meet Mimo, the Mary Kondo of Fitness. In a cluttered world of uh, boutique fitness studies and high-end gear, Guillermo Pineda Morales, also known as Mima, reminds us that we don't need much to be our best. So let's play this now for you guys. Memo. Memo runs far, and Memo runs fast. And somehow, he gets faster with age. Surprise for me too. Today, Memo is one of the top 10 runners in the world for his age group. He's also a porter in an apartment building in Queens, New York. We'll come back to that later. Memo believes in three things. Hard work, never giving up, and... Actually, just two things. Fine. Two things. That's amazing. The American fitness industry is worth over... And if you know anything about um, Mexican fighters or Mexican combat, art, combat fighters or martial artists, the one thing that you will know is that they don't stop, right? They, you, have to, you literally have to kill them if, if you want to win. They will never ever stop. They'll never throw in the towel. They'll just keep coming forward no matter how many times you light them up. So imagine if you're if you have that intrinsically in you as part of your DNA from being a Mexican, right? From coming up in that culture, hard work and never giving up. And then you add in a bit of skill, a bit of talent. Woohoo! You are gonna be an absolute beast. Thirty billion dollars a year. That's a lot of fancy gear and gym memberships. Exactly. But Memo doesn't believe in gadgets. This is Memo's heart monitor. If you can't see via the podcast, he's putting his fingers next to his neck so to measure his heart rate. That's his heart monitor. <laughs> this is Memo's gym. His gym is an out outdoor park. This is Memo's nutrition plan. And his nutrition plan is basically and rice and beans. This is Memo's locker. And he tucks in his um, Memo doesn't in believe in swanky gyms or boutique yoga studios. He doesn't believe in self promotion. Even though there would be wow, a lot he's to got promote. tons of medals. And again, I have tons of medals too, which I, this is another thing part of me as well. 
I have tons of medals too, which I've never posted online, I don't think, and shown off people what I've done. I think I posted maybe a couple pictures of me finishing a race here and there. You know what I'd have to do, actually, thinking back at it. I think if I was going to start reintroducing social media posts into my training or to kind of, you know, show off how much I'm training or what I'm doing, the way that I'd do it is that I would make sure, because now I haven't done it so far, but I wanted to do a plan going forward where every month or every couple of days I did a race or every three weeks, maybe every month probably makes more sense so at the end of the year you you maybe have between 8 to 12 uh bits of bits of content or a medal to show off of your race that you've achieved because usually at the end of each race you get given a medal straight away the pictures come a little bit later but you know you've got something you can show off for the time that you run because the one thing i don't want to get caught into is the idea of like posting up your race confirmation email or showing off where you're going to run but not actually then following through because you've already got the dopamine here or people liking that picture because you know that's essentially what you wanted so if you can kind of stave it if you kind of like pull yourself back resist temptation wait until you finish the race get your medal or get your finishing picture or whatever maybe email to your inbox and even if it's just a proof image and then whack that up into your onto your social media feed that would be a good practice to have and then um maybe the kind of like takeaway message from that would be for everyone else watching will be, look, I'm doing the races. I'm completing them and then I'm uploading my pictures. I'm not just posting. It's like what I said about how I hate um, how some of my friends always upload line sheets or PDFs or like PSD files of like T-shirts and designs they want to do. Like, no, actually make the thing and then put it up. That's more, that, that is more tangible. Um, that's more real, right? That would actually spur you on to maybe actually put in some money and print your own shirts out. But if you just put out the PSD file, it feels like you've already won. At the jpeg of, of the line sheet of your t-shirt it feels like you've already done you've already achieved it whereas if you actually put out the actual physical image it might actually spur you want to actually put some money behind it and produce some t-shirts in the end you never know and maybe as well if you post a picture of you finishing a hackney half or whatever it may be that might spur you on to do another one another one another one another one as opposed to just posting up your training pictures which is nothing really and and, and what's the and really in my opinion what's the point of running if you're not going to race right you want to race i would want to anyway yes yes you know what Memo really believes in? Memo believes in running. It's my life. Make me feel free. Well, in Santa Ana, Cotopec, where Memo grew up, he was an average runner on a pretty average team. It's and pretty Memo awesome that he went from average being an average runner in an average team in, in, his home, in his homeland of Mexico. Then he comes to the US and suddenly, even with all the stresses and struggles you have of being an immigrant in a new country, learning the language, getting so settled down, somehow he's able to like improve on his running with more problems, with quote unquote more problems in the back. Or maybe he had more problems in his homeland because that's why he moved, you never know. But it's still, it's fucking crazy to see that he's getting actually faster the older he's becoming, as opposed to the other way around, where it's like, oh, it's not like his heydays were back in the day when you were younger. It's absolutely nuts. Memo crossed story. the border illegally at age 15. Illegal immigrants come to sick. fire at work. He did find work in America, in a kitchen, and as a bike messenger. And he ran his first marathon in 1995. A year later, he was arrested and sent to jail. I don't got no paper, so they just put me in jail for a while. So I think it was over for me. They're gonna send me to Mexico, but they gave me the, the opportunity to, to see the judge and pay my file and get a lawyer. In 2005, Memo passed his citizenship test and became an American citizen. How many states in the United States, 50 states, was the first president of the United States, George Washington. By 2019, <laughs> he became a top 10 runner globally in his age group and the second fastest American in his age group. That is amazing. Yeah, for Mexico, wow. I'll be a number one, but I, I want to represent the United States, to say thank you for everything I have. Super cool. Now, Memo works in Rigo Park as a porter. I like this building. The mayor signed for the last New York City Marathon. They put in the lobby. They say, congratulations, Memo. You do great. That was really nice for me. I made those signs. That's Memo awesome. took them down one by one. <laughs> he doesn't like to advertise how great of a runner he is. Which, again, how, imagine being, imagine how weird that is now. That is, think of all your mates that you know who are into fitness or have a little hobby on the side. And think about how often they keep reminding you of how great they are with their hobby. I think I've gone through that kind of catharsis. I've gone through that crisis in confidence. 
in realizing that maybe the posts I used to upload all the time of all my books I was reading was just a way of me to kind of mentally masturbate myself, right? Because in general, none of my friends on my social media feed are reading as much as I am or are pursuing um, or are uh, enthusiastically pursuing intellectual pursuits or whatever, I don't know that term, whatever that term is. And even me saying that is me being judgmental, but it was a way to me to kind of separate myself from the herd. But again, was I doing it because I, I was it? Was I doing it because I enjoyed it, or was I doing it because I felt like proving how much better I was than my friends? And then I kind of realized that it might be half and half. Same with the running thing, right? I actually love running. I actually, I'm about this life, right? I go out and run most, every, mostly every single day. But if you're not on my Strava and stuff, you wouldn't know. And if I don't share it on social, no one would know. Um, but then it goes back to that whole adage, right? Um, if a tree falls but no one hears it, did that tree actually fall? And it did, of course it did, right? And you have to, you have to reach a point, especially when it comes to hobbies and interests, especially with stuff that's um, um, requires some sort of physical exertion, things that require some sort of um, willpower, that require some sort of cardiovascular and cardiovascular endurance levels, that require mental acumen. You have to reach that point where you suddenly decide, you know what? I'm doing this because of the love and the thing that I enjoy it for what it is. Because if you're doing it for the approvals of others, you're slowly but surely going to dwindle. That willpower bar will go all the way down. And really and truly, if I think about it properly, actually, my running isn't even dependent on willpower. It's because I actually enjoy doing it. It might take me a while to get out. I'll be like, oh my God, I've got to put myself... But I actually love doing it. It doesn't require willpower. I don't have to like psych myself up to go running. Whereas I have to psych myself up to maybe go to the gym. But to go running, I don't have to psych myself up. I just have to just decide to put my trousers on and my shorts on and I'm ready to go. Um... But I think in general, if you once you reach that point in all the hobbies that you do, that's when real enjoyment comes from it. The enjoyment, as much as it may seem in the beginning, it might come from, you know, how do you say it? It might come from the fact that people are liking your posts and saying how wonderful you are. The real enjoyment comes from the actual, you know, being out there running, seeing yourself improving over time, seeing your weight drop, seeing your times get quick faster and faster. That's where the real, real enjoyment comes from. It. I think for me anyway, personally. <laughs> On November 3rd, Memo will take the day off to run the New York City Marathon. That's awesome, man. He's on track to run faster than ever. Memo reminds us that we're being sold and packaged something that's free. Achievement doesn't come from a sports brand or the latest high-tech gizmo. Agreed. Agreed. Just ask Memo. He believes in just three... Two. Right. Two things. (laughs) Hard work and never give up. Top man. That's the Memo method. (laughs) I'll link the I'll link it in the show notes for you to check out. But yeah, that's def, that memo method is definitely something that I'm kind of thinking of going forward in all the things I do. Just work, do your thing, keep your head down. No need to boast and brag about it on social unless you're obviously creating content on it. But you know, this idea of like social approval for the things you're doing is really ridiculous. And for the most part, that's probably why most of these social media fitness tracking app things haven't really necessarily worked out, right? Even the stuff they've done with Sober October with Whoop. Um, I'm sure some people are going to continue using it. It's a good way maybe to track your exertion and maybe in terms of if you want to just track how much training you're doing to log your workout stuff, that might be beneficial. But in general, that's why probably they don't work because exercise is so hard to kind of package and to kind of uh, contain in one platform, isn't it? It's really difficult to do that so far. Um, it's hard because if you think about it, it but especially if you're thinking about it now, CrossFit boxes, right? are probably the the living or the kind of physical manifestation of a social media, right? You've got the coaches t- giving you instructions. You've got people cheering you on in likes and comments. Um, you've got these pic- you've got these workouts that are very Instagram friendly, right? Whether it's kipping pull ups, whether it's um, snatches, whether it's box jumps, burpees, uh, pull ups, they're all very Instagram friendly, right? You can take a picture of somebody doing those kind of stuff and it looks amazing. You're on the floor after a workout, splayed out, like you've been shot, um, you know, playing COD or something. It's all cool. But for some reason, no one's been able to take that same, to take that and actually put it in social media. I can't think of one person that's done it well. It's really hard to do, unless maybe you're a top crossfit athlete and you have your own friends, because I think in general, you have to someone take, the reason, maybe it's because you have to have someone to take a picture of you in it, right? Even if you're running and you're doing workouts, it's hard to take a picture of yourself doing squats or doing snatches and shit you maybe have to record a video and then maybe screenshot the video and then upload it but for the most part if you want to do a snatch you have to hope people take the picture of you for you and then then you can upload it that way maybe that's the reason why it's gone a bit awry but i think in general exercise should be a, a, a personal pursuit something you kind of you know pursue in your own time 
um you don't subject everyone else to your you know to your training program and in general if you're trying to get something out of it whether it's getting more healthy or lose a bit of weight why does everyone else need to be involved eh why 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 well, what do i know eh what do i know anyway let's move on and get in some topics here because that's what we're here for right topics 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 let's see what we have here what do we have here da, 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 da. let's move this down there a bit okay so number one news um it looks like our man virgil abloh is back back in action as you guys are aware i think he took some time off late, late recently didn't he right for um for health reasons and it appears like he's back now he's back in the building ready to go uh da, 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 da. let's see if i can find it i think i saw the news somewhere yeah there we go so virgil abloh is back as reported by wwd magazine i think they were the first or vogue reported that he was taking a break in the first place so let's quickly read his article and then we can go from there ba, 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 ba. so here we go so virgil abloh is back at action in louis vuitton in paris the designer has been absent from the fashion scene for a few months due to health considerations um virtually at, uh virtually absent from the fashion scene since early september which if you think about it in in the instant especially in the, maybe not instagram world but in the fashion scene world that's a long time in it there's so many marketing events i think you missed in between a couple of fashion shows loads of different appearances probably a couple of dj gigs in 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 the instagram social media um just a uh, scene influencer world uh, affairs this probably seems like a lifetime in it that he's been away especially for the people that wanted to kind of do stuff with him and stuff but in general it's probably a good time to take a break if, if ever you know the the seasons are calling off a little bit more no need to be outside clear-minded no alcohol eating healthy doing a bit of exercise connecting back with your family and shit because i'm pretty sure he's got a couple of kids and a wife in it so that'll probably be nice but yeah it must be it, it must be nice must be nice and also it's good as well going forward because there's a lot of so many you know, you, 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 you watch the Steve McQueen documentary and your heart breaks, isn't it? For such a talented person to go through such turmoil and eventually, you know, take their own life in that in that way. But I think the fashion industry gets a lot of slack. I think they get a lot of, you know, criticism through what has happened, you know, sometimes in terms of, terms of the stuff that they do in the environment, whether it comes to diversity, representation. But I think the one thing the fashion industry has learned quite well to kind of respond to and learn the lessons of from previous years is that because especially because they've lost some we've lost some big talented designers right through you know fatigue through just you know drug abuse alcohol abuse politics in general i think now they've realized that you've lost too much high caliber talent to not repeat the mistakes of old and now i think more so especially if you're rich especially if you're working for the big brands i think they have got a responsibility now to make sure they're looking after their talents because at the end of the day those brands only exist purely due to the talents that they kind of hire in um the cult and the cult following that they kind of uh, bring with them and hopefully that they can then translate that into products and sales blah blah blah, blah. so it's their prerogative to really look after him and say hey virg you're, you're being you're doing too much now you're going a bit crazy you look you look like shit um you know whatever it may be take a break go back home relax recover and then come back on the other side which is quite cool to see but here's the article uh the designer posted an elevator selfie in his personal instagram account on midday on tuesday his face mostly obscured by the lv logo etched into the glass he also turned up unannounced at louis vuitton store at the place venadom over the weekend to inspect deliveries for his full collection uh, this included a hoodie puffer with channels in the shapes of the LV monogram, which he photographed on the floor between his Nike sneakers. Abloh surprised the fashion world when he revealed on September 8th that he would not be present at his off white women's only ready to wear show in Paris Fashion Week later that month. And here's a picture of him there. He's got the new Supreme jacket on his own, which is nice. Um, Virgil shared today that he is shifting gears to a space, to a pace less than his usual constant work travel for a few months due to health cons considerations. The spokesman Abloh said in a statement, Virgil is designing the off-white show in Paris to replace his attendance with a creative new approach that will include crowd participation. He continues his work to closely with his team in Louis Vuitton men's and off-white as well as the brands he collaborates with around the world. In an interview at the same time, the Vogue, Vir Virgil stated that he was slowing down his work and travel schedule due to health concerns. The designer, who is also an in-demand DJ on international circuit, did not specify the medical issue, but I was, I was just tired, so I went to see a doctor. Ultimately, everything is fine, but the doctor told me, this pace, you've sort of, sort of pushed your body to fly all these miles, all these different projects. It's not good for your health. Uh, Vuitton executives expect him to be present at the 4 to 20 men's show 
in Paris scheduled for Jan 14 to 19. So yeah, good a good amount of rest actually, a good break and probably recharge the batteries. And you know, there was a lot of criticism pointed towards Virgil. I think the first couple of fashion shows, especially just when he maybe not the first ones, but yeah, maybe it was the first ones. The first Louis Vuitton one, the second Louis Vuitton one, especially with the stuff he's doing in uh, off white, the collaboration with IKEA, the Nike stuff. It did seem as if from the outside looking in that the amount of even though it's a weird it's a weird position to be in right especially i get have a lot of sympathy for it especially if you're like a kanye these kind of ephemeral figures you've gotten so far in your life not listening to anyone and beating at your um moving to the beat of your own drum that suddenly when it comes to a point where your work is maybe not hitting the levels that it should do the standards or the quality and people start questioning what you're doing it's hard to listen to them because effectively you've got this far by not listening to them, right? By not listening to the crowd. So if you're a virgin and people are telling you to slow down or concentrate, not to sharpen dribble, but just to concentrate on certain on certain collections and to maybe stay, leave leave the DJing a little bit and stop collaborating as much, it's hard to listen to that because part of the reason why you've got the job at Louis Vuitton is because you collaborate with everyone under the sun. It's because you DJ all over the world. It's because you do all these random projects. That's why that's he's been able to build a massive archive or a massive body of work basically over a very short t- period of time so much so he's able to put a gallery exhibition together right which is nuts in it but over time he's been able to build such a mass of projects under his belt he's been able to then show off and say hey this is my portfolio look what these projects have done that covers a huge breadth of of different um fucking disciplines so it's hard now to kind of figure in your head to kind of contemplate or come to a realization that maybe you are um you are kind of diminishing the res- the kind of quality levels of the other projects for the other things that you're doing. And maybe as well going forward, it's not, you know, again, it's, I think, um, I remember Dixon having the same kind of epiphany when he was voted, you know, number one DJ at Resident Advisor. All the bookings were kind of piling in. Seth Troxell went through the same thing. There has to reach a point where you start realizing that just because you got the gigs doesn't mean you should take them. There has to be a point where you're able to, and it's a weird thing on the come up. I think when you, when you're coming up, you have to say yes to everything everything you're yes 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 give me all the projects give me all the jobs i'll take everything on right because you just want to show and prove you want to uh you you want to put your name out there you want to display your talents blah but then it reaches a point where you get to a level where you have to start being selective about the work that you do because it then starts to affect the quality of the work you're actually doing because it's taken away from the time that you're doing it right and if it's if we equate it to an mma fighter they always say like the moment the mma fighters start to you know make albums start to appear on tmz start to do uh you know random podcast or just being on youtube that's essentially when their fight careers i'll take the dip because whilst you're fucking around right um with your friends in a bar somewhere recording a podcast your opponent is in a gym thinking about how to take your head off so you have to kind of have that in your mindset and again it's probably different about design and creative projects because part of the reason why people get into this sort of world is to become a multi-hyphenate right you want to be the person that is able to do this and that and that and that and that but I think similar to like a person like Mark Newson or these kind of people um, or Tom Dixon, you want to be able to maybe do specific projects spread out across a long period of time, maybe three or four spread out across 18 months and then keep your main thing going along as opposed to doing like 12 or 17 like Virgil's done. But again, it comes from the school of streetwear where you just do as much work as possible and you just keep it moving, right? That's the part of the lifestyle that you want to live, right? That's part of the Aaron Bonder of turn your hobby into a job, right? Turn your hobby into an occupation, turn your hobby into a business. Um, it's what you do anyway, so why not? It's what you would have done anyway for free. Why not continue doing it on a higher level? And especially if someone's emailing you to go play Circle Local in DC10, right? And to design a cl- collaboration with Ikea and to make a Nike collaboration and then to take a Louis Vuitton job, you'd be dumb not to say yes to all of them, right? Why would you say no? Um, but I guess now going forward, especially with your health being a, a major concern, especially nowadays with mental health issues too being a big concern, and just the pace of fashion, um, it's probably beneficial for your friends and your family that you are of sane mind, right? Of some sort of clarity and able to kind of take that thing forward. And again, it just goes to show just how much pressure is at the top of those kind of trees. It's not, that's the thing that probably a lot of those fashion students that like, get on show studio and kind of, you know, diss people like Virgil's or them Sam, Samuel Ross's and stuff don't really understand that once you've reached those real high levels, especially with Sam Ross's, the amount of investment he's getting pushed into him with the amount of, um, production as the the up the uptake in production the fact that i'm now seeing a cold war everywhere the fact that essentially a cold war is turning into it feels like the uk version of armani right he's just going to be a it's going to turn over to an actual behemoth of a brand you can tell he's going to make a lot of money with that brand and probably go off and do other things but once you reach that kind of level that real sh- shit starts to really hit the fan 
it becomes real pressure. It's not something you're doing in your little um, warehouse apartment in the middle of, I don't know, you know what I mean? Um, Tottenham Hill. This becomes like a real big business where a lot of people are counting on you. A lot of pressure's on you. You're having to pay employees. The pressure's really on. So you're, you, you, you owe it to yourself to be a clear mind as possible to kind of achieve it. And again, only a certain amount of people can do that job. It's a very specific job. It's a very specific talent. It's a very specific kind of work ethic as well. Um, flying all over the world, I can't imagine what kind of miles that guy has on his fucking um, <laughs> on his membership card. Whatever, maybe he must have like fly so insanely miles. Um, but yeah, it's flipping, cool. it's flipping cool to see though going forward. And again, maybe as well, it might spur on a new kind of health and fitness, mental health kind of clarity thing, right? That might be a cool incentive we might see going forward. Workshop concerning that, um, and re- maybe go, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that might be, but I, I, but I think most people are aware of just how much work hard work it takes. I don't think this is a surprise. I um, think most people know that you know to to pray at that le- high high level, you have to really be, you know, working you know, ungodly amount of hours. And now we've seen how much it actually takes. So yeah, Virgil's back in action. So interesting to see what happens next. What how the pace of these collaborations goes, the pace of his uploads on his social media account, and just generally how he carries himself going forward. It's interesting to see how that how that kind of you know. Re- you know evolves over time let's see as that kind of progresses but yeah um welcome back to the scene i guess and hopefully with the fashion scene of rule takes that as a cue and starts to apply that to their other designers to their fashion teams and also starts to um implement these kind of um extended periods of breaks or kind of a bit of time away from the fashion scene just to kind of collect your thoughts because i know a lot of fashion people go away in august you know to kind of you know exotic locations to kind of unwind but actual times where you can kind of go away and kind of take a break away from the fucking hectic schedule especially not even just for the big um creative directors or the big marquee names in the companies even the people that are just working in the company day to day probably deserve some level of break because i can only imagine what it's like working in a fashion house during fucking show season right um it must be just insane amount of hours you're putting in weekly and of course because you love it you don't really notice the amount of times you're working but it does require some level of um uh some level of balance i think to kind of get it right but yeah welcome back to the scene welcome back to the scene all right next on list what do we have here uh, get this up here it's not really working is it what is that here back on the scene jada g leaves berlin for london this is this is pretty interesting i, I i've only heard of this now actually uh, Jada G, who I, f- I think I featured a couple of times a year before, right on the on the podcast regarding um, just how you know how she approached things when it came to her deck mantle set, the kind of conflict that she was having in terms of dealing with the fame post deck mantle and dealing with that sort of stuff. Has kind of given a short interview with um, Electronic Beats where she essentially details her decision to move away from Berlin back to London, which you don't really hear a lot about. You hear a lot of people moving from Berlin to other European cities or going to other maybe more exotic locations, but to come back to London or to come to London in the first place is a very strange um, decision to do, especially considering the fact that Berlin, for the most part, is, you know, for some Londoners who are part of the scene, who want to be involved in the electronic music space, is the kind of, like, the mecca of that kind of um of that kind of lifestyle um to be an art to be a bohemian artist hippie dippy whatever it may be that's the place that you would go and do it right to kind of suspend belief and essentially become an adult or essentially um uh, continue your life as an adult child right no real responsibilities cost of living is real low um a big social network of people who are also trying to find their way and fumbling through life it's just essentially it's made it's kind of um constructed or made uh possible not made possible but it's uh put together in a way where it kind of allows people who want to live that kind of lifestyle to do it to the fullest extent and of course on the other side of it it also has all the distractions in terms of clubs in terms of nightlife in terms of drugs in terms of drinking that would also make you go the other way right so you can easily get lost in the source so it's kind of a weird balance in it but jdg decided to do the other thing around and kind of move away from it so let's kind of quickly go through the conversation and hear what she has to say around it um so this is jdg here in his article, a, Jada G, a conversation with Jada G about Berlin's significant changes in environmental t- toxicology. Jada D is a Canadian DJ and environmental toxicologist known for her euphoric house and disco sets. She released significant changes, her debut LP on Ninja Tune earlier this year, which is, you don't really hear that as a byline of a DJ, right? Someone that is a DJ, put on LP and also studies environmental environmental toxicology. Pretty, pretty cool. So here it is, right? Um, this is a Jada G interview. The question. 
when did you get your new place in london and how is it how's it going how's the move going um i moved last july right after i toured for six days i had to go play the weekend night after i got to london was it hard to leave berlin um yes and no in june i was chilling in berlin and met all these new people i thought i maybe could build a community with and maybe i can deal with the german language but as soon as I moved to London, it was like, oh yeah, this is the best decision. I wouldn't have changed going to Berlin for the world. It essentially changed my life, but it was a hard change. It was a hard place to live. I can't knock the Berlin experience. I learned what I'm capable of it. I'm capable of. It really made me appreciate where I come from and what it's like to be a foreign person in a foreign country. It's really difficult to move to another place where you don't speak the language and you don't understand the culture, but it wasn't for a lack of trying. And I think that's a very good point. I think um, as much as I love Berlin, I have a lot of love for it. And it's a place that I've always kind of held close to my heart. I think after maybe the third or fourth time, I realized quite quickly that it probably isn't the place that I'd want to live in day to day. I think if I had, if I, once I get the ability to buy a place here in London and maybe buy other properties, my dr my dream is to eventually buy a flat or property in Berlin so that every time I wanted to go and party for the summer, I could easily just go chill out have a place to stay in and then in the winter months i could rent it out on airbnb because obviously there's a big demand for those kind of properties over there but i realized it wasn't for me day to day because essentially all the vices that i'm prone to indulging in in london are already available to you in berlin and societally um the attitude around partying and going out isn't as frowned upon as it is here in the uk even though people here party and get fucked up in the uk in berlin and these kind of places it's on a whole different level right people are just going out and getting fucked up continuously basically all week round right um especially if you have the means to do it especially if you are part of a community that encourages it it's something that you can easily get yourself trapped into and of course part of the allure of it is that got through getting through that kind of through you living that cd underground lifestyle you might eventually have the possibility to also connect with a little community of people that actually inspire you to start a label start a studio open up a business um, whatever it may be but there is you know that's that kind of little um pot of gold at the end of the rainbow but for the most of the time you're just going to end up getting fucked up and being involved in that debaucherous lifestyle so i realize it's the place for me to go and dip in and dip out but i also think in general if you're because i think reading past jada g interviews if she tracks me as a person who enjoys djing enjoys you know um being amongst the electronic music scene and being an artist but she has bigger goals, things, aims out bigger, that outweigh the kind of stuff that she's doing in music. And if you read the rest of the interview, you'll see clearly she's got a lot of ideas um, that are far bigger than what she's doing as being a DJ behind the decks. So because of that, maybe she's not as infatuated or as in love or as head over heels um, about the idea of going out to some CD nightclub somewhere in, in the middle of Berlin and getting fucked up. It's not that much of a bigger allure to her. She essentially DJing is a, is a, is a job that she loves, but it's essentially still just a job. So because of that, I can imagine why Berlin would be a bit hard to kind of deal with. And because, you know, you haven't kind of grown up kind of, you know, idolizing or fantasizing about living there like I have over the years. And also just in general, like as well, she mentioned about the language is something that you don't really realize a lot. But the language is a big hurdle, especially if you're actually trying to live there day to day. Yes, you can have a community of people that speak English. And you can just hang around, do your thing. But um, I'm I'm of the thinking, especially most British people, I think for the most part, we're quite cognitive or we're quite conscious of the fact that when we go to new countries, we want to know some bits of the language, right? How many people in Britain, how many English people have you bumped into going traveling around Southeast Asia, around Central America like I have? And you bumped into them and most of the people have some command of a little bit of language, right? Whether it's a bit of Spanish, a bit of Vietnamese, right? we always try to make an effort i feel as if like most british people that i meet obviously there's some people that don't make an effort but for the most part british people around my kind of age range you are very conscious about integrating properly into a city or into a place that you're living so but german language isn't the most easy language to learn even though people that learn languages say that the germanic language is quite similar to, it's the probably the easiest language to learn closest to english usually i don't know why grammar wise but getting to grips with learning german is probably hard especially when you are in that party lifestyle and you haven't got a consistent schedule and you're not going to study as much and you know usually when you move there you don't really have a command of the language it can be hard to deal with and getting a house set up sorting out your bank your residency documents especially if you go through the reddit there's a berlin subreddit that kind of goes through people moving away to berlin and you can kind of see how difficult it is to kind of get yourself situated and get your feet under the table i can see how difficult it can be but i'm happy that she was been she's been so open about how difficult it's been because i think sometimes people can romanticize that experience a lot and i still think that most places even london is a good example 
they are they do you it, it requires a certain kind of personality a certain type of character trait a certain type of drive to make it work because on the same on the same side of you know you go to berlin and it's full of you know debaucherous activities and nightlife you know on tap when you come back to london it's not as if you saw what saw roses in right do you know what i mean like if you come to london and you're g you might end up bumping into a group of people who are despite who kind of um, not despise you, but who have reservations about inviting you into a social group because you might take away all their gigs. Um, there's a lot of famine thinking in the UK. People are very close. People are very clo- um, close fists with their opportunities or the chance they want to give away. Unless you have obviously a good group of people that can show you in, but it takes a lot of time to warm people to break into. It, t- it takes a lot of time to warm people up in London to make sure to make them your friends, right, or to to infiltrate their com- their social group. People in London are very very standoffish. So in the same way in Berlin, where the language barrier doesn't allow you to kind of maybe integrate yourself more, you're usually more able to kind of happenstance bump into groups of people that are able to take you up to different parties and meet you, connect you to different people. But in London, the clo- doors are a bit closed. Obviously, once you're in, you're in. But once you're out, you're out. You really do feel like out. So it's not as if like it's not without its risk coming back. But it's definitely cool to see that she decided, you know what, even though, because I can imagine after LP come out and all the Dick Mantle stuff come out, she probably had gigs coming out of her ass in Berlin, right? Loads of opportunities. You can fly to different places around Europe. So to decide to come out to London and pay exorbitant amount of rent again and all that stuff, it might, it must have been a hard decision to make. But in general, you know, you have to do what's best for your career going forward. Um, here's what she says as well. Um, because the interview continues it's nice to hear your perspective on living in berlin i think many realities of living in the city take a while to unfold and it's nice when the thoughts are given space do you have any examples of how the language barrier was a problem as a dj um which is something you don't hear a lot about people talking about right really in general like you know things do take time to unfold like you think it's all it's like the honeymoon period right in a relationship then after time you start actually living with a person day to day you start realizing oh shit i hate the way you yawn do you know what I mean? It has to, you have to kind of live with it over a period of time. Anyway, here's her answer. Um, I didn't partake so much in the party culture because the language barrier made me feel unsafe in most instances and did not, which is very something, again, you don't think about if you're not a girl, right? Imagine <clears throat> moving to a place like Germany and being a fairly attractive girl like JDG and then not knowing where, you know, not knowing the situation that you're in, in a party because the language barrier or the lack of understanding of cultural norms is kind of throwing off a bit. You just would rather just, you know what, I'm not going to get blacked out drunk because I don't know what's going to happen to me when I wake up. Or I don't know what, what state I'm going to be in when I wake up. So I'd rather just kind of step away from it. And it kind of takes you out of the moment, isn't it, as well? So it's, it must have been a hard decision to do. Anyway, she continues. For instance, I was going out in London the other night and some guy was going around touching people and being disrespectful. Most of the women noticed immediately and had security take him out. Cool. A issue done, solved, and, and, you know, finito. In Berlin, I wouldn't know if the person was malicious or just open, open sexuality, sexually because I didn't, couldn't communicate well enough. Um, last time we spoke you mentioned you had a new manager and overall team could you speak on your career changes so far things have changed quite a bit since 2007 in Boiler Room I started playing bigger shows more people recognised me but things have changed rapidly in 2019 to a point where I can't even really process what's happened because I've been working through changes but I've had to adapt quite quickly the team is really new I'm fortunate enough to have the people working with me I work well with my manager and his assistant and that's been good the biggest thing that no one talks about as an artist is, have, is what happens when you release a successful debut album. As an artist, you start by creating the content, you set the stage, you get the idea of what you are, of what you're creating, and you try to produce w- work that you makes you happy. When you finally have something to show for it, then you throw it out to the world. Woohoo! Yay! It's done. I didn't realize what kind of aftermath there would be, and that's when having a manager comes in handy. When you are working with a label, which was which has been new for me because I've been self-releasing with underground labels until now. Immediately, as soon as I landed in the work, things amped up considerably. Then I had to start working to big decisions while learning a new way of communicating with the music industry. It's an entire culture. That's pretty cool. So the first bit about being a girl and understanding how to maneuver in different places is something that I'm happy she brought about. I think nowadays, especially with social media, especially with um, communities such as Reddit, you are you would be remiss or you would be doing yourself a big disservice to move to a new city without kind of reaching out and going on the city subreddit or finding a hashtag somewhere on social media especially on twitter and asking questions be like hey i'm a young girl i'm I'm this age i'm coming from this background i'm moving away does anyone have experience of moving to this place or even going on youtube and find there's always somebody going to find on youtube who's moved to a certain location to get an idea of how it is because it must be difficult to maneuver in these places because i imagine somewhere like a central america south america between for a woman and for a man will be totally different experiences so it's probably advantageous for you to kind of figure out how those places work for you personally um 
and then going forward as well with the release of the album and the aftermath of it that's something i've always wondered too um i know in music industry most people most labels and managers always say always treat your next record like the hit record right so kind of plan plan that well, everything that you drop is going to be the thing that's going to make you blow so that you have a plan in place because that's that's when planning actually matters the most right what you do after the the kind of initial blow up right um you saw it happen with russ um with that uh, best in the world when rihanna posted it and he went yeah that song went completely kapoop you have to have the video in place which he already did he learned up some interviews um there's obviously the book in place there's a plan that looks like that it was in place after he dropped best in the world so that even if, if best in the world didn't blow you could just add a couple of months into each plan and then you can kind of stretch it out but then if for instance by coincidence one of the biggest pop stars in the world and rihanna decides to make a video of your song then you can immediately start to like quicken the pace and start to drop all those announcements week by week but again it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of effort and it takes some kind of foresight and also it takes managers agents uh people around in your circle um fighting your fight for you which comes back to the idea i said before of like you know if you're a kid out there and you're pursuing trying to be a dj or electronic music star maybe you might be best served instead of kind of going inside this kind of really completely crowded arena of being a dj maybe it's best served you kind of reaching out to someone like this or somebody that's on a come up and helping them out with their rollouts helping them out with their graphics helping them out with their placements helping them out with bookings whatever it may be or just being someone around that's helping a helping hand so you can kind of understand how the industry works from the inside working in and also you can kind of carve your own lane that isn't necessarily in the crowded lane of being a dj and i think a lot of people these more people than not need these help like she said only recently jada g like she changed her management when in 2009 no in 2019 right she changed her managers so imagine all those years she needed help but from the outside looking in you think she's kind of got sort of things sorted out she's doing but she needs a lot of help she needs someone to assist her somebody to kind of give a bit of direction and for all the kids out there who are kind of you know scraping and scratching over you know only a certain amount of dj gigs maybe your time is best served setting up your own little agency right and representing local djs in your scene who kind of need a bit of assistance that'll kind of go a long way to kind of um, pushing it forward but it's quite cool to see how she's kind of handled things going forward especially since the dick mantle thing um it seemed as if like it was a blessing and a curse right it kind of boosts your profile makes you a bigger person people start to want more from you start to be a little bit more needy um extracting of the value exchange is a bit gross but over time you know a bit of a wild ride in berlin back in london now you get to again the berlin move are probably appreciative too because even when you go through sharing experiences it does probably um focus your vision and your idea on what you actually want and now she knows exactly what she wants it's not what she was doing beforehand it's definitely what she's doing now and now we're probably going to see the best of it going forward so yeah i recommend you check it out it's a really fascinating interview the rest of it she speaks about her environmental toxicology work which i'm sure some of you guys will be interested in but i recommend you check it out debut lp is significant changes available now on all your streaming platforms or your digital stream platforms dsps <laughs> and uh interview link i'll post in the show notes for you guys to check out so see that there boom 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 what else is next here um sneaker app that lets you customize your shoes oh god remember i was talking about hybrid sneakers well it's not going to end i don't know what i I don't know if it's a a a thing about the customers wanting to see or the brands using it as a way to kind of cheat and get some market research but i saw this app yesterday um it's called sneaker generator app allows you anyone to create custom footwear silhouettes which i don't know why you want to do this right at first, I thought it was a colorway thing, which would have be been more interesting because then, you know, you have the opportunity to kind of fuck around a colorway to maybe um, dabble in, you know, creating your own sort of like shoe design sort of thing. <coughs> Showed it up on social media. But this is weird. So this is a app called. What is it called? Yeah, sorry about that. Bit nasty there. What can you do? Um, so it's a sneaker generator app, right? It allows anyone to create custom footwear silhouettes. It's a sneaker generator app. And I've got it on the screen here. So essentially, you're going to be able to put hybrid shoes together. So on the screen now, we've got um, that weird Hirachi with a thing front on it and Hirachi grip. We've got Air Max 97s with an Air Max 1 sole. We've got Jordans with different soles on. We've got those weird Gucci shoes with different soles on. 
So essentially, you can you can join them together. I'm pretty sure, right? So it's the it's, this is the text on your sneak uh, customization app. I don't know why you want to do this. It's so horrible. Um, see, customizations have naturally taken to Instagram to show their creations of the world, which are always generally shit. Apart from that studio in um, Holland, that's helped Virgil do some shoes, and I think they're well known in the industry. Um, I think they might have did that shoe for um, Kendrick Lamar too, that Cortez with the sock on it. I don't forgot, it's a design studio in, um, I think it's called Studio Hog or Studio, I forgot forgot the name of it, but it's a design studio in Holland. They do really good stuff. But apart from them, they're all fucking garbage, especially the, the sneaker designers that make fucking Python leather skin, Jordan 1s. Like, just allow it. Leave leave them alone. Anyway, this is the text. See, customizations I've taken, naturally taken to Instagram to show off their creations to the world. But the feat is only av- truly available to those willing to physically deconstruct and reconstruct shoes or spend hours in Photoshop pieces together design elements. The up and coming sneaker generator app aims to provide an entry level sneaker customization experience to anyone with a smartphone. Sneaker generator app allows users to pull various elements from their favorite sneakers and mix and match them to create entirely new silhouette. Why would you want to do that? Mix and match silhouette. Honestly, this is the this is we're living in an era of so much un, um, unoriginality. From all these all these shapes were created by men or by humans, just like me and you, right? They sat there, they they had this pen or pencil in their hand and they sketched out an idea for a sneaker design why can't you do the same thing why can't you take an element of a shoe that you love give it a little tweak and make your own shoe not just take an element of a shoe that already exists take off the sole take off the midsole and glue them together like some sort of weird frankenstein shoe why not make your own new shoe i don't understand this it's not that hard it really isn't like to sketch a design of a shoe like is it that difficult to do it's probably on the same part as making a t-shirt a new t-shirt design Figure out something that you're interested in. Take a, a logo that you like, flip it, um, you know, edit it by 3%, whatever it may be called, that Virgil rule, and you've suddenly got a new t-shirt design on your hands. It's not that hard to do. I really don't get this. Like, why would you want to do this? Like, why? And also, you're providing these brands with fucking free insights and inspirations into stuff that they're going to create and not give you any money, like any royalties. This doesn't make any sort of sense. This app continuously updates its offerings based on the latest footwear drops to keep things relevant. As quick release get cycles move on to the next hyped shoe, users have the ability to combine different upper soles from Nike, Adidas, Gucci, and Off White, which is stupid because why? Why would they ever work? To, again, it doesn't make any sense, um, especially since most of the Gucci and Off White stuff is taking inspiration from the actual um, sports uh, or the athletic brand shoes. Anyway, that's where they're coming from. Most of the innovation is coming from this, the actual sports brands, and then it's taken up to the higher or high end brands. Most of the high end brand shoes are fucking garbage for the most part. Because they don't actually make the new, they don't actually make anything new. Changing colors and accessories as they see fit. It's just garbage. All these shoes here, you've got like Air Maxes with that weird Versace chain reaction sole. You've got Jordan ones with an Air Trainer one sole. You've got like, why would you spend any time doing this if you're a kid? Like, you should be spending time creating a new shoe, making your own brand, um, or maybe design, redes- actually physically redesigning an actual physical product. Like, what is this garbage? Additionally, a sneaker generator apps to create continually around sneaker customization. Once the design is complete, it can instantly be uploaded to social media, of course, with the app users are able to comment and share, cop or drop. People just, oh, it's, honestly, it's one of the worst things I've seen in this year. It's really, really horrible. I don't get why it's a thing. Why would you want to do hybrid shoes? I don't get it. They all look garbage. None of them have looked great. I just don't understand why it's a thing. It really is a waste of time. What a waste of time. And they all look garbage. There's not one that looks like, there's this thing, what is this got? It's got like a, you've got like a Yeezy sole here with, what's that What's that from? Is that from the 3D printed ADES and a back of something else? I don't know why you'd want that. They just look all, they mostly look terrible. Mostly look terrible for the most part. Like you should just leave the job to the professionals. Like, I don't, honestly, I don't know why you do this if you're a kid. It makes absolutely no sense. I'd rather spend my time sketching something on, on Photoshop. And it's not as if you could spend hours on Photoshop doing it. It takes not that, you know, get the Magic Wand app, a few bits of outlines and traces, a couple of layers, and you can do this in a couple of seconds on sneaker app. And it's just, I don't get it. I really don't. I used to spend a lot of time on Nike ID, right? Putting things together on there, but why the fuck would I do it on here? Like, why would I do that? Like, why? Why would I do that? It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. I don't get it. I really don't get it, man. It's a really bizarre thing to do. Um, I guess if that's your way to go go forward and do things, then fair enough. But, you know, you kids are weird, man. This is what you want to do with your life. Fair enough. But <clears throat> sneaker generator app, like, it doesn't make any sense. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. But, yeah, check it out if you want to. It's av- is it available now on the, on the app store? I'm pretty sure, right? On all the fucking silly app stores and stuff. But, yeah. Check it out if you want. You know I don't endorse it. Hate hate hybrid shoes. We we'll always hate hybrid shoes. Um, yeah. 
No, thank you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's garbage. Pure, pure not a garbage in my opinion. Pure not a garbage. Um, let's continue on. Come on more because you know I've got a phone call. I probably might mean I have to head off to work now. One more. What else we have here? Oh, this is quite nice. Nike have released this Atmos collaboration that looks similar to like the Viotech Dunk spec in the Air Force One model, which looks pretty fucking cool. Um, the Viotech Dunks have come back out again, right? You've seen those. You've seen the Viotech Air Max Ones that have kind of come back out again. We might see the reintroduction of the NL non-linear um, Dunk that came out back in the day. Hopefully, we'll see a look at that. But I remember before making a, a, a video about how um, influential and how amazing the, the the JP exclusive Air Maxes were and the, the Air Force Ones. And this is another example of it. Atmos, you know, a legendary store in Japan, has put together this crazy collaboration. Um, collaboration called uh pop the street capsule so they've got air force ones and, and i think some clothing as well included in it but the air force one looks so fucking good so essentially it looks like a suede or nubuck upper completely all of it right all the way around you've got like you've got some lilac tones in the front toe box so you've got like a purple on the side and the toe box is all lilac you've got red in the middle orange at the back and a black swoosh and you've got quite a little kind of like off-white sales sole black mid blacks outsole and the lace stays are black and then you've got a massive nice bright hit of neon green on the back uh pull tab where the nike where the nike sign is but it just looks fucking beautiful and on the instep you've got the bl blue and the tiffany green sort of colorway on there they look fucking gorgeous i really like the combination between these kind of really light colorways or these pastel sort of colorways and the black laces on the top um usually with these sort of collaborations you usually see them opt for like a white outsole and then the white sort of like lace stays and the white laces to kind of offset them a bit easier better i think color combination wise but i like what they've done here with the other combination of the black on the inside and the black on the outside which makes it possible for you to kind of wear you know a few more darker pants wearing these and it will look pretty cool too but they, they just they look fucking beautiful the shape the colorway i love the fact that you've got that kind of off-white sail midsole there just very very good cool collaboration they also come i don't know what that what, what air max is that that where is that that's the air barrage i'm not really a fan of that but that's just, you know you'll see a lot of um really swagged out japanese dudes wearing these sort of shoes and because they're size eight and lower and five foot five they make these trainers look fucking awesome but for a guy that's got size 11 feet an air barrage probably isn't the right thing to go about and if you don't know what an air barrage looks like google it and you'll see what i mean it definitely won't look good um above a size um, nine in my opinion um so those, those are a cool colorway too similar sort of mold and then you've got the apparel to go with it you've got a nice little hooded top in black and gray you've got a t-shirt as well in black and white and just a really solid collaboration man really really beautiful collaboration um, so here, we, here we, we can read a bit of the text here nike and japanese retailer atmos have added yet another project to their long portfolio collaborations this time around the pair have created an expansive capsule that includes brightly colored um iterations of the air force one and the air barrage mid the main um, inspiration behind the lineup was Japanese pop culture, drawing from the series of reference points like contemporary art and, and manga. The result is an assemblage of bright colors, of air, blah, blah, stop talking rubbish here, high piece. The next piece is the air barrage. Um, so the, the pop street capsule collection, the most important thing is going to come out November 9th for Atmos.co.uk. You're going to have to get it by proxy, it seems like. they might. You know what? The, the other thing is, well, that might be a bit of a piss -tick. They might not be available in bigger sizes. I know sometimes Atmos does these collaborations. They usually do them Japan sizes, and they usually don't go above a size 10. So if you've got a big foot, then you might not be in luck here. But they're going to be available from the 9th. They're going to price price starts from the $41 to 138 So I'm assuming the T-shirt is 41 and probably the Air Barrage is probably the expensive thing at $138, which is not that much at all. You'll be able to find proxies online quite easily. Just Google uh, Japanese proxies, uh, shipping services and stuff. You'll be able to find them available. And sometimes if you're lucky, you can email the stores directly. And they usually have one or two people there who speak English. You might be able to help you out and get an international order put in. Just pay, probably PayPal them. But I really recommend checking them out. They look a little bit shit on this picture though, on this Instagram picture. I'm not going to be honest. Uh, but they look better here with the lighting. With a bit more of a light. The orange looks a little bit more lighter than it does there. Not sure if that's a Photoshop thing or whatever maybe, but... I do like the colorway. I think they look really, really nice. Uh, the barrage I'm probably not a big fan of, but I think the the actual Air Force One is probably the best thing they've done in a while, or I've seen in a while. But in terms of Air Force Ones, and obviously the T-shirts and stuff look really nice as well. And it's a solid collaboration. I think again, Atmos is probably 
you know, maybe second only to maybe undefeated and stuff in terms of just like solid in-store collaborations, you know, the little capsule creations that they do put together. I know sides have probably taken a lot of inspiration through that, some of the studios they do, but, you know, they don't really do as well as Atmos do. They've got a long history in sneakers. You can only have to Google some of the, of the previous Nike Atmos collaborations to know how good they've been. But yeah, definitely something that I would add to my uh, repertoire of sneakers, you know, sooner rather than later if I was that way inclined. But definitely come and check them out. Uh, Nike Atmos Pop, was that Pop what? No, Pop Smoke. Pop the Street Capsule Collection. Really cool. Um, really well done. Really well put together. And again, something that's been perfect for these nice chilly wintry months when you want a bit of pop and color in your feet. Footwear going forward but yeah really really nice man i love them i think they look amazing really cool color really. and again like i said very clear the use of black in this color way because it doesn't really seem like it makes sense in this sort of color way but i like it i like it i like it a lot i like it a lot um okay that might be it for now thanks so much for tuning in one hour in i got head off to work it's the excellent zinger show episode number 245 as always please check out my website excellentzinger.com for more links regarding what i'm up to dj gigs and social media links for that malarkey if you're watching it via the youtube app why not leave me a thumbs up subscribe and so you can check again what i'm up to um if you're listening via the podcast app leave me a five-star review we've got a long way of people finding out the show and what it's about and until next time until we meet again my friends i'll see you guys very soon take care bye peace